Okay. Okay. So? Okay. Kommt das gut rüber? Okay. Ach, das ist nur für die Aufnahmen, oder wie? Das ist nur für die Aufnahmen? Ah, okay. Alles klar. Okay, hello everybody. I would like to welcome to you my talk about using Sphinx to create a multi-language, multi-view DSL tool environments. I would like to uh, briefly introduce myself. My name is Stefan Eberle. <coughs> I'm from Germany, but I'm now living and working in France for ITMS, and I'm basically a modeling guy. Um, so here's what I'm going to, take to talk about today. So first of all, I would like to look a little bit at the problem field system engineering tools. Then I would like to, like to explain you what the Sphinx project is about and what you can do with Sphinx in order to create um, system engineering tools more conveniently and uh, yeah, more better. Okay, so here a quick uh, retrospect about um, system engineering. <coughs> I have to say that this is uh, related to the automotive domain but there is a similar development <coughs> in other domains as well. So the Stone Age was we had specifications, waterfall model, and we, um, no, it's, a, it's an error, we implemented the code by hand, okay? The next step was that we introduced uh, model-based sof model software development, model-driven software development. So we had a specification, we created simulation models, we could detect errors very early in the development process, and we started to generate code. The next step is that uh, we have to handle uh, more and more increasing complexity. There's not only a single vendor on the market who's working on a device, but uh, if you look at the vehicle systems, there are many manufacturers and second tier suppliers involved. And at the end of the day, all the different pieces of software and hardware have to fit together. So there was the need for a common architecture and for a language for defining this architecture. This was the AutoSAS standard which came up and that was this is more and more used in addition to the, uh, the purely functional uh, modeling of the behavior of the system. And nowadays, this is still not enough. There are not more issues coming up. There's a new standard, ISO 262, and this has to be incorporated into the development processes. And in order to, to, to do so, we need even more modeling languages on top of it. So we need, in, on top of the modeling of the so software architecture, which we can do with Autosar, we need another language, East ADL, for modeling a functional architecture which is independent of hardware software. And we are also more and more doing requirements engineering uh, in the model based and model driven way. So, what I want to say here system engineering is great because there's a lot of modeling to be done. So, what it means is that we, have, that we need tools where all kinds of different modeling languages get incorporated, get put together, get federated, and of course, we need uh, an integrated tooling for all these modeling languages. <coughs> so, if you're in a situation like me, uh, I'm creating modeling tools or I'm helping people to create such, then this is the common problem. You have an Eclipse, already some modeling languages being used, and you want to add, integrate yet another one in the Eclipse environment. And you have to take 
into account two high-level requirements. The first one is, of course, you need to create an adequate tooling for that modeling language in Eclipse. And the second is that the modeling language, once you have integrated it, you have to, it has to be well integrated and to be interoperable with the other modeling languages that are there. Yeah? Because we are not anymore, any longer talking about an AutoSAR tool or about an UML tool. We want to have a tool chain where you can do both and where you can switch from UML to AutoSAR or vice versa. So, and then you have, of course, the option to do the tool support for your modeling language from scratch. That's clearly possible. The disadvantage is that you have a quite a lot of work to do, but there is also quite a lot of support around in the Eclipse, especially in the Eclipse modeling project. But that really becomes difficult is with the interoperability with respect to the other modeling language. Because if everyone who wants to integrate a new modeling language in an Eclipse-based toolchain comes up with its, with its own um, technology stack, then it's very unlikely that the different modeling tools are really very well fitting together at the end. So the second option, and this is what we are going to address in this talk, is Sphinx, because this is a project which attempts to help you in exactly this use case. So what's Sphinx uh, from a perspective of 4,000 meters? So first of all, Sphinx has the objective um, that it becomes, that, that you have to uh, put less effort in your development of your modeling tool. And imagine the situation as follows. You take Eclipse and you want to create some modeling tool for some modeling language, could be AutoSAR for instance. Then you have to create a meta model implementation for the standard. You could also imagine that you don't have AutoSAR but a, a proprietary DSL which you really design according to your company internal needs. Then you need, would need to implement this DSL in some way. So you can all do this today with Eclipse, but when you have done this, then you will detect there's a big gap. Uh, because if you compare what you get out of Eclipse and what the end user needs, then there are plenty of things missing. And what we try to do with things is to fill this gap. We are not at the end of the work, but we have started to do so. And of course, um, then they have done this for one modeling language. And the objective is not to um, provide this only for Autosar, by the, by the way, Sphinx has been created in exactly this use case because Sphinx originally comes from the Artor project and the Artor project is there for providing a platform <coughs> to more easily develop Autosar based design tools. But we found that given that uh, a whole bunch of the functionality that you need in t on top of the meta model implementation is purely generic, we found it a pity to leave these pieces in Artop and so we extracted this part from Artop and it became the Sphinx project at Eclipse. And this puts us in the situation that we can today reuse Sphinx for other modeling languages. Currently there are activities uh, to implement East IDL in the form, in the similar form as AutoSAR has been implemented in RTOP. And RecEF, this is another Eclipse project, which um, uh, RecEF is an OMG standard which has been implemented in another already existing Eclipse project. It's the RMF project. And you could also come up with your own DSL. And the idea is that instead of reinventing the modeling platform technology stack, you use Sphinx to get uh, along more quickly. And of course, uh, if we use the same infrastructure across different modeling languages, then we have fairly better chances that the different tools are more interoperable. So this is a high level objective of Sphinx. And now in, I want to go some more into the details and make a tour of the framework and show what uh, we are able to do as of today. So what things is in more detail, so the high level summary is here and now I want to show a little demo and focus on one first aspect of things which is to provide an integrated modeling tool environment for a given modeling language. Okay, so first thing is I go to my development workspace and I start um, as always as, as one does it almost always in a new modeling project I take the library example which is pretty well known and so we consider that the library example of EMF is a modeling language that we want to support um, in the Sphinx uh, framework. <coughs> so what I have here in my workspace is this is directly the, the example project as they come uh, from EMF I haven't uh, 
change anything. And I've um, um, provided two, yes, Sphinx or IDE integration um, plugins. And so these plugins contain um, very little amount of code to create some, cost, some sort of IDE experience for the library model. So let's just have a look at the extent of the code. I don't go into the details here, just want to show that you that we have uh, one class here with a couple of lines, so it's not so long. And um, um, <coughs> extension point contribution. Well, this um, meta model descriptor is basically contributed to um, Sphinx. And uh, in the second plugin, which is um, responsible for the UI contribution, there's no code. There we have only extension point declarations that we make some extensions to the common navigator framework and to the form editor. So this is all what you need um, in, in, the very in, in, this in the easiest case at the very beginning. And if you switch to the runtime workspace, then you get this. So we have a little perspective um, where we have a model explorer. The model explorer is the equivalent of the project explorer, but in contrast to the project explorer, you can of course uh, navigate into the file, so it doesn't stop here. And when you do this, then Sphinx automatically loads the file, and you can see all the elements that are there. You can also see the properties of the model elements um, and the property view. You can um, ch change the properties. Um, when the model becomes dirty, you can save it. Um, you can create new elements inside this model and so on and so on. So this is one thing. And um, what you also can do, you can, as usual, open the, the file which contains the model in an editor. Um, here, this is the editor that we have contributed from Sphinx. Um, this is not so much surprising because it, the, it's in no way different or not very much different from the editor that you normally generate um, when you use just EMF, except from the fact that it is a form editor. Uh, but the interesting thing comes here because uh, traditionally Eclipse is pretty much file-based. But when we are dealing with models, we want to have the same primitives of the IDE also available for model elements, not only for files. So that means that I want to be able to go to that model element here and open the model element in the editor. Yeah? And here you can see what the difference is. So in I open the other one, the other, no, I cannot. I have to go one level deeper. <laughs> so I can open this model element in the editor, and then instead of, instead of exposing the whole model in the editor, it, the editor uh, root is just the element, the model element, which is inside, uh, some, somehow deeper inside the model structure. And I can, of course, go to another model element and uh, open this other model element in an editor too. And so, yeah, do what I do with a model, which I, what I normally do with files. And that's the idea here. And of course, again, here you have the properties view and you can, you can change also the model from, from here and uh, save the model and so on. Yeah, so, and what, uh, what we can see also here is um, or another example for a primitive, which is very convenient for files is this um, synchronized with the, the link with editor button. Yeah? Because if you have opened up plenty of uh, model elements in your IDE, then you, have, you, don't, you, you completely lose track of which editor uh, belongs actually to which model element. And what you can do then is uh, to, do <coughs> to activate this button, and then you can select the editor you write who you'd like to, and see the corresponding element which gets automatically selected in the model explorer. And the other way around, it's also true. If you s click on a model element that um, for which an editor is opened, then this editor gets automatically activated. This is nothing surprising, very surprising, but um, this is an example of what I meant before when I said there is a big gap. Yeah? Because users, when you ship a tool to the end users, <coughs> users just expect this kind of functionality. But in, but in Eclipse, by default, it's not there. And therefore, we have uh, implemented that because we needed that for Odessar, but the generic, the functionality of linking uh, editors with model element is pretty much generic. It's no, in, in no way Odessar specific. And therefore, we put such kind of functionalities uh, into the things framework because there we have the potential to reuse the same functionality for any other modeling language that we want. So this is a quick tour of the basic features. Now, 
the next thing is that we have said we want not to integrate only a single modeling language, but multiple lang modeling languages. So let's have a look what this looks like in practice. Hopla. Yeah, so we have seen the, the nice kind of support that you get more or less out of the box when you integrate your modeling language XYZ. And we can also see um, what we have done in Ortosar. Here we have an, an Ortosar project yeah, where we have an Ortosar file. And if I open this one, then I can navigate into the Ortosar structure. And you can see here I have completely different model elements, but the same primitives are available. So I can open here the um, the Autosar model element, it's a software component definition in the form editor again. And you can see here, of course, you, the, the form editor, it behaves in the same way. Yeah? So you can also activate this link with editor button and, the, uh, and this link with editor functions for Autosar in the very same way as we have seen that for library. Um, but you can, of course, customize it. Uh, so the UI not, does not need to have be only tree-based. You can add any form pages that you want because we are, of course, extensible. So you can see here we have this support for Autosar, and we have also done this for demonstration purposes and integration with the UML2 meta model, which is already available as an Eclipse project. So we have, as we have done it for the library model, we have uh, uh, written two tiny things integration plugins for UML, and then you can, uh, if you like it, open UML models or UML model elements in uh, in this form editor. I mean, this is clearly not the the end objective to edit. UML in, in such a form editor, that they are more likely to, to be added graphically, but we don't go further here because there is already an Eclipse project which is taking care of all that. Here we just wanted to show, to show <laughs> that the generic base functionality, which is reusable, can be applied to uh, different kinds of meta models. So these are the basic features of Sphinx. And another thing which is very important uh, especially from the point of view of the automotive industry, is the fact that the models can become pretty big. So, so far we have just played around with uh, some very little example models and there many things are functioning very nicely and, and are quite fine. But when it comes to um, deal with uh, many megabytes of data or many files in the workspace, then things are likely to become much more difficult. So the only reason in terms of big models then you have to take into account basically two things. There's not just the amount of data which you're processing in the model. There's also the question of how many files, over how many files the model is split. Yeah? And you have to be able to cope with uh, both of these challenges. And here I want to come up with a, a representative example. So here we have a reference model which has 60 megabyte of XML data and is spread over 5,000 files. So if we go back to the Sphinx workspace, to the right one, then we have it here. So this is our reference, our Autosar reference mo uh, meta model ECHO. And if I open this, then the model loading starts. So here, uh, right now it doesn't start yet because um, this is just Eclipse here because um, the files are inside this folder and there's a number of 5,000 files in the folder and now um, Eclipse is building all the tree item it takes to display this um, yeah, in the UI. I, I mean, normally you would not put 5,000 files as a flat list into a folder, then this would be much quicker. Okay, and once um, this has been finished, then I can navigate into this file. Uh, yeah, now it's starting. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> okay, so now the process is finished. So it has taken, yeah, now the loading is finished. So it has been, the model has been loaded in the, in the background. Normally you see a nice progress bar. It didn't appear here because uh, while Eclipse was refreshing the tree view, the whole UI was blocked. Um, if the tree items are already available and you only have to reload the model files, then you normally get a, a nice progress bar. But anyway, now we have loaded the model and uh, you can, I will quickly select all the files so you can see um, 
down here that we have 5,000 files. And now I can go into any of these files, um, open the model in the tree viewer, change the name, um, blah, save the file back, and it behaves as with the little models, with the little example models that we had before. Okay. So this is a big model. And another important thing here is um, if now we have managed to load such a big models with 5,000 files and so on, and when it comes to handling these files in, in the IDE, we do not want to do what is being done traditionally in Eclipse, because if you open an Eclipse an editor, then this editor loads its own model instance into its own private resource set. If you open a second editor, then the second editor creates again a model instance in the memory. But here we have seen it's, um, okay, it's not so, so bad, but it's already taking quite a lot of time to load the model just a single time, and it, of course, occupies a lot of memory. And therefore, we have in Sphinx a service that we call workspace management, and this service makes the models available in the whole workspace a single time, and that means that all the editors and all the views which are operating on the model are working on the same model instance. You have maybe you have seen before in the demo when we changed a thing in the model explorer, then also the editors became dirty immediately, and this is due to this fact because uh, the editors that we open, they are basically just views on the model instance that is, that is managed centrally. And this is also an important aspect which it is necessary when it comes to dealing with uh, models that are bigger than just little examples. Okay, some of, this thing, uh, some of you might think that, um, so what we have seen so far, it's just trees and forms and so on, but system engineering is of course much more because in system engineering we need to support multiple views. And what we think is necessary is to have, aside from tree-based and form-based, textual representations and graphical representations. Of course, again, all this in Eclipse. So here we go. Let's see how things can deal with Graffiti and GMF. So I have here prepared a little example project where, I have, um, ex where we have a modeling language which we use as example throughout um, Sphinx. And it's called Hummingbird. It's like AutoSar, it's about modeling components and interfaces, but it's much, um, much less complicated than AutoSAR and the meta model has much uh, less model elements. And so we have here um, the possibility on the one hand to specify um, component types and we have to spe the possibility to specify instances of those types. And for defining the types, we have created a graffiti-based uh, diagram editor. It's not very feature-rich in, in terms of graphical editing. But what we wanted to show here is the integration with things. Because again here, the same pattern applies, which I have just um, explained before. This editor does not load its own model instance. It works on the centrally shared model instance that is managed by Sphinx. And that means if we go here into this um, instance model file, uh, no, in, the, pardon me, in, the, in the type model file, then we can see here um, the same components and interfaces. Yeah, here we have, for instance, the interface BB. And if I change it now here in the model explorer, then you can see that the change is being done in the graphical editor uh, synchronously and at the same time. And as the model explorer, also the graphical editor becomes dirty. And I can switch to the graphical editor. And um, you know, here we haven't supported the properties view, so I cannot change anything. But what I can do, I can um, add, for instance, another interface here and say, um, interface C, and if you do this, um, then the interface is at automatically appears also in the model explorer view. Of course, you can then also save all this, and then you're fine. Um, in Sphinx, we don't have any uh, preference for what technology is the best for creating graphical editors. We know there is the Graffiti framework and there is the older GMF framework, and uh, and. What is interesting for us is that you have the possibility to, to do graphical editing in a synchronized way with form-based and tree-based editing. And so we provide the same support that we have just seen for uh, Graffiti, also for um, GMF. And so here we have um, an instance model editor. So it's not longer about editing 
um, component types, but component instances. And here the principle is pretty much the same. So you can see here I have my two components, um, component instances, A and B. I can here with a GMF at um, a third one. So GMF comes out of the box with some support for properties U. So I can go here and uh, change the, the properties when he's the name of my component instances directly in the graphical editor. And as we have seen in with Graffiti, the, the uh, model explorer, so the centrally managed model, uh, changes automatically along with that. Yeah, so that's how we can support graphical modeling. And the next aspect that you want to have of the model is uh, textual. And here also um, a tiny little demo of that. So here, we have um, a project where you can again edit the hummingbird model. And what you can do normally in Xtext, you have a <coughs> file in the workspace and you can open it with a traditional Xtext editor uh, where you have um, code completion and, and all that stuff. Um, but as usual in Eclipse, this editor works on the complete file. This is totally okay if you have a, f a uh, file with just a few model elements and the things are over easy to oversee. But if you have files which contain six or 7,000 software component definitions, uh, then it becomes less convenient to uh, deal with all of them in a single file. And therefore, what we want to do is to be able to say, okay, we go to the component type that we are interested in and we open that guy in a textual editor. And so here we have basically a textual editor that is um, integrated into a form editor. And you can again see here in the model explorer, we have these, uh, uh, the component type has some parameters that you can configure at instantiation time. And uh, then you can go for instance here and say you add a new parameter, let's say new data type, word, and the comma. So now we have, a, again, a valid xText model. And um, if you go back here, then we can see here this new parameter type immediately popping up. And normally, I hope that this <coughs> works, if I delete this parameter again here, then you have seen that this parameter goes immediately away in the textual editor again. I have not hit on the save button or anything, so here this text, x text based textual editor is perfectly synchronized with um, the, the rest of the Stings framework. Yeah, there might still be things missing. The answer is clearly yes, because system engineering is even more than that we have seen so far. Additional aspects that have to be taken into account is certifi cert certification and long time support or very long time support. But what you have seen here is that the Sphinx is already is not addressing and has also not the objective to addressing all the aspects of system engineering. But we can deal with multiple modeling languages, by the way, also with different versions of the same modeling language. We can deal with uh, not with really big data in terms of petabytes or something, but at least with models that are, have a, a quite a respectful size. And we can create multiple different views on the same uh, model that is managed in the workspace. And for the other aspects, there are industry working groups at Eclipse that uh, are dedicated to system engineering, one with more a focus on automotive, the automotive industry working group, and the other one for Polasys. And so if you're interested in those aspects, go to these uh, industry working groups, and there we can have a nice collaboration about all these topics. Yeah, this is the end of my presentation. I thank you very much, and yeah, would like to answer your questions. Thank you.
still had some 2010 Dolly Charter installation of software.